We're live. Live in Sila. Hi, everybody. Good evening. 27 of you there. Uh, I'm Jeff Udick. I'm going to be uh, your presenter live on YouTube live. because this is the Sila. incredible Hi, stuff that we can do today. And that's Amanda pausing her video to make sure you don't get the audio feedback. Amanda, I'll hand it over to you for opening remarks. Okay, perfect. Um, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight on YouTube. Uh, my name is Amanda Barnett and I am currently serving as the president of the SELA Education Foundation. Um, first and foremost, I wanna say thank you guys for being here tonight. Um, we do appreciate it because we know um, at the core of all of our work is our students. And so you being here um, really helps support them as we go into the 2021 school year. Um, so part of the SELA Education Foundation, um, like many other entities, we've had to kind of shift gears with COVID-19 um, and take a little bit of a different approach on how we help support SELA students. Um, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with the foundation, um, the SELA Education Foundation was established in 2015 um, by a group of dedicated individuals who really just wanted to enhance programs equipment, services, and opportunities for students um, in the SELA School District. Um, because of your guys' continuous support um, over the last five years, we have been able to bring in Jeff tonight um, to not only support our students, but also our families um, who are taking on this challenge of distance learning um, with us. Um, so if you are interested in seeing how you can help support the SELA Education Foundation or contribute in any way, um, we do have a website. It is selaeducationfoundation.org. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Jeff. Um, so we've got lots of great learning tonight. Awesome. Thank you, Amanda. It's great to be here. I wish I could be there in person in SELA. Uh, I love driving down I-82, uh, do a lot of work with a lot of school districts, including a lot of the SELA teachers since back in April. So it's been really, it's been, it's been good and I'm glad to be back even if it is in a virtual sense. Uh, as we get going today, I wanna encourage you, the chat is a place for you. It's a place to ask questions. You will see uh, Shane is hanging out over there. Amanda's hanging out over there. If you have questions there, hopefully there'll be some time at the end for a little question and answer session. If you want to have a copy of the presentation, it is linked in the description below here. So if you look at the description of this video, you might have to click on see more uh, or view more in the description. And when you do that, there should be a link there for you that is takes you to the presentation we're gonna go through tonight. So if you wanna do that. Also, if there are other parents, if you have friends uh, that aren't here or that you know wanted to be here and maybe forgot, you can text them real quick and say, hey, head on over to this link and you can watch this live. It is being recorded, so you can go back and watch this if you want, or if somebody couldn't make it tonight, because I know our family schedules are always so busy, uh, know that you can go back and watch this anytime you would like. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and get us started tonight on our presentation. And what we're gonna be talking about is a couple, a couple of different things as we get going. But the first thing is just being connected in a digital world. And as we head into this incredible school year uh, where there's nothing perfect about it, it is what it is, but we have so many opportunities. And that's really what I wanna talk about tonight is how are, we taking, how are we taking advantage of the opportunities that all of a sudden present themselves with this as well. And I want us to, to be in that kind of mindset tonight as we get going. We're gonna be sharing some resources for you as parents uh, and guardians and, and those that support uh, our students and be talking about what you can be expecting from your school and why you can be expecting this type of learning moving forward in the 2021 school year. And so that's kind of where we're gonna get started. And I want us just to be thinking about where we are because it's we are in this just incredible time period when it comes to understanding uh, the technology that we have at our fingertips and taking advantage of it. So as we get started, I just wanted to go down memory lane a little bit, right? And just, this is one of the, just fascinating things for me is like, I look at, I look at pictures like this and I just wonder how many of you watching remember having a membership card to Blockbuster. And it's so interesting because I was actually talking with a, with a young student the other day and he couldn't figure out why do we call it rewind, right? You either fast forward or you fast playback. There's no rewind. Like rewinding is, is a word that we use that actually comes from this technology that we don't use in technology like this, right? There is no rewind on Netflix. You, there's rewatch. You could rewatch 15 seconds, rewatch 30 seconds, rewatch the entire episode if you want. Blockbuster doesn't even exist anymore. And yet we all watch Netflix. 
what an incredible time period that you can watch any show the moment you want to watch it. And that's just the world that we have. Or how about this technology? This is one of my favorite when we talk about music. This is actually a, a quiz that I love to give middle schoolers sometimes. I ask middle schoolers, how do you use these two pieces of technology together? And it's not to write on the label, right? For those of you who grew up in the 80s, you might over in the chat be able to tell us, anybody remember how you use these two pieces of technology together? Of course, this was the technology at the time. You might remember your first Walkman. Walkmans were this incredible invention that allowed us to take music on the go. For the first time, we went from boombox on your shoulder to you could strap this onto your belt and we would take our music with us. That's what the eight track and the tape player did. But of course we speed up to today and you can listen to any song the moment you want to hear it. Right now you can probably just pick up your phone and you can ask it to play any song. Right? How incredible the time period that we live in and thinking about that your children and students today have only known the time period where there are things like Spotify, where there is no real physical representation of music. And it's something that I, I love to talk to students about, right? that we all had a physical representation of music, whether it was a cassette player, an eight track, uh, you know, a record back in the day. But now music is nothing but bits and bytes. And it's just this crazy world that we live in. But with that, we can listen to anything the moment we want it. Some of you might remember this, one of the first video games. Yes, if there are kids out there walking today, this was a revolutionizing video game. This thing was incredible. It's called Pong back in the day. And you actually had a little dial that you had to turn back and forth, played hours for Pong. Versus today, we have Fortnite, where kids, millions of kids around the world can play at the same time. You can play against... Uh, your friends, you can create teams with your friends, and just the incredible opportunity we have to collaborate in so many new ways and in so many different spaces. Right? And as we get started today, and just be thinking about where we are in 2020 and moving forward, is we want to be thinking about how many connected devices do you have as a family. So I'd like you, if you're watching this right now, I'd like you to be looking around your house and try to count how many devices are in your house that connect to the internet? So if you have a smart TV, right? If you have an Alexa or a Google Home, a Ring doorbell, maybe your car has built-in GPS, maybe you have two or three cell phones, maybe you have a smartwatch, maybe you have the new cool dishwasher or crock pot or slow cooker, right? PS4s, PlayStations, all of those connect to the internet. Can you count how many, how many devices are in your house that connect to the internet? And when you think about that for a second, what I'd like you to do then is the only math I'm going to ask you to do tonight is can you come up with your family ratio, right? Your family ratio, how many devices per person in your house? And it's so crazy because I don't know how we got here in 2020, right? That, you know, first it was the phone and then it was, you know, security systems or whatever else we bought. And next thing you know, we live in a world where we have six connected devices per household, right? We're looking at six connected devices per person on average in America or about 11 connected devices per household in America as of this year. The research for this, if you have that slide deck, which can be found in the description below, you can go look at the data. The last time we had any data on this was 2018 of just all the incredible ways that we have the ability to connect, which in my world, if you're gonna have a pandemic, now's the time to have it, right? And yeah, you know what? Last spring, it caught us all by surprise and schools did the best they could to educate kids. And teachers did an incredible job of figuring out how to very quickly do the best we can. But now we had time. We had summer. We need to expect more from our schools. We've had time to dig into research. We've had time for teachers to have training. And it's going to be an incredible year that we get to take advantage of all this stuff that we live with. I keep telling the teachers, you know, that education was one of the last industries to be disrupted by the internet. And I'm not saying it's all good. I don't want kids learning online. I want kids back in the classroom. I want kids to be back full-time in the classroom as soon as it is safe to do so. 
but it isn't just an incredible time to take advantage of these connected devices we have around us that a lot of times we take for granted on what we can do with those on any given day. And here's the thing I love. I love when you actually Google for pictures of families that you find these different photos and none of them to me look like reality. I love this one, right? There's two devices. The kids are on the devices and you have four adults trying to help two kids. I hardly ever see that. Or I love this one. This is one of my favorite photos where the kids are on devices and mom has just got a smile on her face, you know, so excited to watch her kids play on devices. I hardly ever hear or see that at home. I see more of this. This is what I actually see. You know, everybody is on their own device and we're watching TV, right? This is family time. And I want us to think about that, right? At family time at your house, does everybody put away devices? That's family time. Family time is not sitting down to watch TV where everybody is still on their own device and we're watching the screen. This family right now that you're looking at, five, dis five screens for four people, right? Multi-screen viewing is the norm. But if we truly want family time, we've got to make time to disconnect and connect with each other. And a lot of times that means putting down the devices. And whenever I'm working with families, I will tell you this, it's usually not the kids that have the hardest time putting down the device when it comes to spending time with their families. Now, what I also want to talk about is the world we find ourselves in here in 2020 and beyond and what that looks like. And we call it our new digital culture. And part of that is, is the impact that this is having on schools and already was having on schools. We were already headed down there. In a study a few years ago, and this is the last time they did this, was in about 2016, they actually reached out to university professors, both at the community college, technical colleges, and four-year universities across the nation. And remember, this is 2016. And they asked them, how important is technology in the learning environment as we're preparing kids? Because in K-12 education, our job is to prepare students for college, career, and life as set out by OSPI. And so you saw in 2016, we were already seeing 71% of universities said that they were already expecting kids to learn somehow online, right? In fact, when they were asked, do you assign homework that requires technology? 94% of professors said they did, which means we have to be graduating kids who know how to learn online. You need to know how to turn in an assignment online. You need to know how to find your assignment online. And you don't just teach that when you're a senior. That is a new skill. One of the questions that I'm constantly asking teachers is, are we preparing students for their future or our past? And their future, even without this, even without this, their future is going to be more digital. Going through this pandemic is going to just speed up that process. That is what we're seeing. When I'm talking to state legislators here in our state, I talk about that. I think what happened is this thing sped up education by a good five years on the train we were already headed down. Will technology play a positive role in education in the future? 97% of university professors believe so back in 2016. Because we have it, right? It's here for us. In December 11th, right before all of this started, there was a new survey that had just come out that showed that 35% of undergraduates were taking at least one online class. 35%, that's one in every three, needs to know how to learn online. And we're not just talking universities, we're talking community colleges, vocational colleges, technical colleges, we're talking about the army, and we're talking about businesses, especially during the pandemic, are now using online courses for new employees. So you need to know how to learn online. And we have an advantage here that we happen to be in a time where we can teach kids how to learn online. And again, I don't want this to be the norm but do we take advantage of it, right? I just want, I mean, it's here. Let's not waste it. Let's not waste it until we get kids back, which I so want to do so bad. But until that happens, how can we take advantage of it? And even since this pandemic started, we have seen changes to the educational system. On June 11th, the University of Washington has removed all standardized testing requirements for incoming students at the end of this year. That means no SAT or ACT is needed if you want to go to the University of Washington. And of course, the University of Washington makes this claim and every other public university in our state follows suit. See, your students aren't going to need to take the SAT or ACT, which is great because K-12 education teachers have been pushing for years that it didn't support kids going to university. 
there was no, there is no correlation between students doing well on an SAT and how well they do in college. We've known that you, we've known that information for years and it took a pandemic for it to finally make us make a change. And it's not just universities. This survey came out in July 14th. So this is in the middle of the COVID crisis. A study found that 82% of business leaders say their organization plans to let employees continue to work from home at least sometime with 47%, almost 50% of companies say all employees could do so permanently. So not only do we need to teach kids how to learn online, we're going to have to teach kids how to work online. They're not going to go to an office like we did. They're not going to, their, their future is forever going to be changed when you can do remote work. So are we teaching children? How are you a self-motivator at home when you don't have a boss standing over you? We need to prepare kids for their future and not our past. And when we talk about their future and not our past, we have to look at where we are headed in the future. The future of work is remote. The future of work is you don't have to move to a big city like Seattle if you want to work for a company. You can still live in Sela and work for a company anywhere in the world. How cool is that? The possibilities that this generation is going to have if you know how to work that way. How are we taking this opportunity to prepare kids for their future and not our past? Right? And so let's take advantage of it. Let's take advantage of it. And here are some things we know, parents. When we're trying to prepare kids, right, for working from home, from doing work at home, here are some just small things that research says makes a big difference. First and foremost, you got to get dressed. The research behind getting up and getting out of your pajamas and putting on clothes does chemical things in the brain that tells you I, something is changing. So, something's changing. We can't just sit around all day in our PJs. So we need to get kids, get them up and get them dressed, get them out of their pajamas and get them dressed and get into that routine, just like you were going to school. If you as a family had a first day of school routine where maybe you took pictures of the kids or, or you took kids out, you know, for a breakfast, be thinking about how do we continue to do those routines? How do we still make school a big deal? Whether it's your first year going to kindergarten or you're starting your senior year in this crazy time. It's really important that you learn to get up and get dressed. It's a motivator. It changes our outlook on the day. So how can we help our students? How can you help your children get up, get dressed? The other thing they show is brushing your teeth. Get up, get dressed, brush your teeth. Research shows that having a regular routine in the morning of getting dressed, brushing your teeth, taking a shower, whatever your routine is, you keep the routine. No matter if you're gonna work from home, or you're going into the office, having a routine gets your day started. It changes the chemicals in the brain. The second thing we need to do is we need to make sure we create a space for learning. And it doesn't need to be a fancy space. I love this picture, right? Kid's got his cup of coffee. It's a hot chocolate, right? He's got his iPad up on a, a book of magazines, but you, you see he's got his pencils. He's got some grapes there for snack. This kid's ready to learn. And he happens to be sitting at the kitchen table. When we talk about creating a space for learning, you know, we need to have a space that you go to to learn, right? Yeah, it, needs, it, can't be the, it can't be the couch where you relax. And even if you have been working from home for this time, you probably notice that there's something different when you go and work over there and you go relax in that chair over there. And the same thing, we've got to set up that same structure for our students at home. When it's time to go to school, you're going to sit over here. This is your office, wherever that office happens to be and make it as comfortable as possible. I love this, a little bucket of grapes, a hot chocolate. We're ready to rock and roll. And think of the advantages. You probably couldn't have grapes and hot chocolate sitting on your desk when you were in school. Let's take advantage of it. What's that gonna look like, right? As we move forward, critical, get up, get dressed, brush your teeth and have a place to work. Do your work, get your work done. The other thing is, is to have a quiet place to concentrate. Now, if your house, isn't quiet and some houses are not quiet and that's perfectly okay, then it is perfectly appropriate for a student to have in earbuds or headphones to help drown out the noise of everyday life. Now, what research will tell you is, is it, it's what's important is what students are listening to in those headphones. Anytime that you can have music that doesn't have words, that's the best. 
So kids can listen to any type of music that they want to, as long as there are no words. You don't want another human voice being in your ear, talking to you, singing to you while you're trying to process new information. This is why you've probably heard listening to classical music or jazz is the best for the brain. Even just some white noise, right? Even just some white noise. If you go to YouTube and you just start searching white noise for studying, you're going to find videos of just white noise that kids can just, just to drown out and just be in your head, which is where learning occurs. So if your house isn't quiet, then it's, it's perfectly appropriate. But let's make sure there's no human voices in, in the music. That's, it's critical. It's brain researched. That's what we need to have if kids are going to listen to music. The other thing is, is to help create a schedule. And I can't emphasize this enough. Helping students as young as possible be in charge of their own schedule is building a life skill for a generation who is going to work from home. It's building a life skill for kids when they go to university and you're in charge of your own schedule. No matter the age of your children. You know, what's incredible is if, you're, if your child has one of these, a cell phone, if your child has a cell phone, help them to use the calendar app. When, I, when I'm working with kids and I get an opportunity to work with kids, especially around our state, I am shocked how many middle school and high school kids don't use the calendar built into their phone. And in a time where you need to be able to manage your own time, especially in a pandemic like this. If I'm a high school kid, I might three hours a day need to be babysitting my younger brothers and sisters. And if that's the case, I'm probably not going to be able to focus on my work. That needs to be in your schedule. Or maybe you have a part-time job. That needs to be in your schedule. Or maybe you have chores for mom and dad. Where's that at in your schedule? We schedule everything. Put it in your phone. Learn to use a calendar. It's a critical skill for kids. Critical skill. Now, as we get into learning, and teachers start passing out assignments and we start having due dates on getting work done, that goes in your calendar too. Here's a project in science. The project is due on Friday. The teacher's going to tell us that it's gonna take about an hour of work. When do we have an hour over the next week? And we wanna break it in, it's the next slide. We wanna break it into 20 minute chunks. But where are you gonna find? And we sit down with our children as young as kindergarten and first grade. Where do we want to put 20 minutes working on science? Where do you want to do 20 minutes of reading? It doesn't have to be a fancy calendar, but we do need to help students understand the power of scheduling and then do the best you can to stick to the schedule. It doesn't always work, right? Schedules get messed up and that's okay. It's all right. But having a schedule is a life skill, is a life skill for a generation. Now, when we're scheduling work time, what we want is we want 20 minute chunks. And this is why we don't want kids on a Zoom meeting all day or Google Meets. If you are working from home and you happen to be on Zoom meetings or Google Meets all day, you know how horribly exhausting it is. And here's the problem. If kids are in Zoom meetings all day, they're not actually learning. The research is very clear on this. When you are in a Zoom meeting, you're so busy listening and interacting and trying to keep up, you're not doing the work that you need to do that's learning. You can't work on your math assignment when you're in a Zoom. I can't write the essay when I'm in a Zoom. I, I have to have space. So we are doing the best we can. It's still critical. I want to have Zooms so I can see my friends, so I can see my teacher, I can get feedback, I can be part of conversations and discussions, 100% absolutely but I don't need that six hours a day. We are, going to, we are going to wear kids out. We are going to wear teachers out. We are going to wear parents out if we were to have kids on six hour Zooms a day. So we're not going to do that. There's no research behind it. It is not best practice. In fact, the opposite is true. The research and best practice for teaching in a remote situation like this is to have kids watch asynchronous videos, have kids watch instructional videos. And that's what we want teachers focused on. Now, from a standpoint at home, what we're looking at is we want our home schedule. When you are supporting your child, creating a schedule, we want to chunk learning into 20 minute chunks. Nobody can sit for an hour to focus. Nobody can even sit for 45 minutes. 
Research shows that the best that humans can do is about 20 minutes of learning time. Now, if your children are pre-K, kindergarten, first grade, that's probably closer to 10 minutes. And to start the school year, good luck if you can get five. But we wanna work towards 20 minute chunks of learning. We want breaks in between those 20 minute chunks. So we're gonna work on math for 20 minutes. Then we're gonna take a five to 10 minute break. Then we're gonna work on uh, ELA for 20 minutes, take a break. Work on science for 20 minutes, take a break, All right? Go read a book, have some free explore time or create time where you get to create things with stuff around the house. But the key is also, brain research tells us that the break must be active. The break isn't sitting back, slouching in your chair and drinking some more hot cocoa. The break has to be, you get up, you go out, you run around, it's like recess. There's a reason why we have recess, especially in elementary schools. There's a reason why even at the middle school, high school level, during breaks or during lunchtime, kids are out running around playing games outside. It's good for the brain. So we need to structure time where we have this 20 minutes of focused learning and then a five or 10 minute active break. And I encourage you that if you need support with coming up with fun things to do with those five or 10 minute breaks, please reach out to your PE teachers. Your PE teachers can create instructional videos to give you some fun five and 10 minute things that maybe you do as a family. Because if you're working at home, it's good for you too. If you're working from home, the whole family sets a timer for 20 minutes. We all do our work. And then we all get to go have fun for five minutes, 10 minutes, do jumpy jacks, run around the house, jump on the bed, right? Be active and then get back to work and focus. It's not just good for kids. This is good for all humans. It's good for all humans, right? So we wanna see 20 minute chunks of learning. Again, calendar it out. Where is that? What does that look like? And then have active breaks in between. And again, reach out to your PE teachers if you need some help and support with that. We are going to actually see a lot of our PE time is going to be in things like 20 minute breaks or sorry, five minute and 10 minute breaks. It's going to be in these playing games as a family, running around, playing tag. There's only a million different ways to play tag real quick, especially while the weather's still nice. I know right now it's a little hot over there, but you know. And this might be the best purchase you make. If you, if you buy one thing and you don't have an egg timer, you can run out to any store and buy yourself an egg timer. I think they're less than a dollar nowadays and you set it for 20 minutes. And then it just helps when you see a timer, when we see how much time's left, we're able to focus. And it's good for all of us. You don't have to have an egg timer. The timer on your phone works. The timer on the microwave works. If you want to just set a timer on the microwave, but set a timer, right? Set a timer. And maybe at the start of the school year, you're going to set a timer for 10 minutes. And then over time, we're just going to slowly increase it because we've been on summer holiday for a while. And we've got to get the brain trained to be able to focus in 20 minute increments. So get it somehow. Again, for all of us, when we're actually learning or working from home, right? Now, there's a couple other things that I would strongly encourage families to do during this time. There's things like having a family read time for 30 minutes. This is maybe one of my favorite things because you've been at home all day as a family, probably people running around, you've been having your active breaks. You as a parent have probably been, maybe you've been at work all day and you're just getting home. And so what if we had 30 minutes of family read time? And I, I don't care parents, if you're just scrolling through Facebook, my goal is here is what if it was just 30 minutes of just a quiet house? where everybody was taking the opportunity to read. Parents, guardians, when you do this, you are showing examples of what good learners do. They read. You're also giving yourself a break. Everybody gets to be quiet. We all just sit and read for 30 minutes. And let me tell you, parents, it's the most beautiful 30 minutes of the day. You get a chance to take a breath, get to breathe a little bit after a hard day at work, wearing a mask all day, whatever happened, to be your situation, right? Maybe you just get 30 minutes every night at 5.30 to 6 or 20 minutes. Start with 10. Goals to work up to 30. Set the timer. And we're just quietly reading, right? Also be thinking about exercise as a family. 
What would it look like if three days a week we had family exercise time where we all get to go out and walk around the house, run around the house, go for a walk down the block, play Frisbee, play catch, kick a soccer ball. Right? So those are some things that we'd like to see families do that are supporting the work that we're doing within schools. Can we get 30 minutes of daily reading and three days a week of family active time, if not more? Three days to me would be the minimum. But most importantly, parents, most importantly, parents, your job is to be their cheerleader. Your job is to be there for them. Your job is to encourage them in any and every way possible. And be able to ask the school district for help. There, I've been talking, when I, when I talked to Shane and to Amanda, Sila has done an incredible job to get every child access to the internet. If you need help getting access to the internet, please reach out to your school. If your child is struggling, please reach out to your teacher. Right? Be their cheerleader, but also encourage them. Set the timer for 20 minutes. Help them with the schedule. Be there when they're frustrated and they start to struggle because struggle, so good. If your child is struggling, that means learning's happening. Learning happens when we struggle. And it's so important to do that. Now, the company that we uh, got started and to support the state uh, is called Shifting Schools. And I'm so excited that just this week, I think, or maybe last week, we released some supporting parent modules for parents, guardians, childcare um, people. So in partnership with the Association of ESDs, We've created four modules that parents can go through on their own. There's research here. There are templates here. There's some videos you can watch. So the four are, what is, what is a learning management system? For you, this is going to be this thing called Google Classroom. Why is it so important? Why is it important that my child go every single day to Google Classroom? And we're going to talk about that. We talk about giving you all kinds of resources, both video and written, to create an at-home learning system. There's a whole module on how do you support your child like a coach? How are you that cheerleader? Supporting them as they struggle. And then as a parent, what are the little things we can do every day that will encourage a growth mindset and why struggle is good for learning? And we're here to support you through it. I'm excited to tell you that these have been released. They're all in English at the moment, but our partnership with the state ESDs, educational service districts and our state legislators these are going to be made available in nine different languages, including for the deaf and blind, with our goal of being at the end of September. So they've just come out in English, and we're in the process of getting them into other languages. And I'm sure somebody can put over in the chat, can maybe drop the link to where these are. Um, if you have the slide deck yourself, I put the link there at the bottom on this slide. You can go over. They are free. They are free for you to pass on to anybody else. They are free for anybody to take and improve and work on. It's all about giving back to our parents who are just the most incredible people in the world for supporting their kids through this. Now, what I want to talk about is I'd like to talk about why we're taking an approach that we are taking. And the approach that we're taking is, first of all, research-based best practice in education. It's what we do. But we also have to understand that we have this incredible website called YouTube. And YouTube is the greatest educational website ever created by mankind, ever created by mankind. It's an incredible website. In fact, I would love for you over in the chat, there are 44 of you watching live. I'd love for you to share something amazingly cool that you have watched or you've learned by watching your YouTube video. We, we have people who are fixing their cars. We have people who are gardening, who are fixing appliances, dishwashers in their house, right? Because you see, instructional videos work. And if you watch YouTube videos to fix drywall, update your house, I'd love, I can't wait to see what comes up in the chat as you all start to talk about what is something cool you've learned by making a YouTube video or watching a YouTube video. But understand instructional videos work, and that's what we want teachers doing. We want teachers creating instructional videos for students. Because students, this generation, is a media first generation, and they've been watching people give them instructions for a long time, right, on YouTube. 
And this is usually what we hear, right? On YouTube, oops. When kids are watching YouTube videos, right? They're watching other people play games. And I love it because parents all the time are like, well, kids are just sitting around watching other kids play video games. And I know, I mean, if only they were the first generation to sit around and watch other people play games, right? The game is different. The game is different. The screen is different. But humans have been sitting around watching other people play games for a long time. This entire country on Sundays pretty much shuts down to watch other people play a game. Watching, watching people play games is not new. And so we have, to, we have to think about what is actually happening. In fact, I would say students watching other kids play games is different than the way I watch Jeopardy or Wheel of Fortune or Survivor. I never watched Wheel of Fortune thinking someday I was going to be good enough to be on Wheel of Fortune. But kids today watch other kids play video games to learn how to be better at the video game, to learn how to be better at the video games. They're instructional videos. These kids know how to learn through video. And that's why we're going to have teachers create instructional videos. We don't want them on Zooms. We want them in instructional videos where their teacher is going to be giving them the instruction the moment they need to learn it. Because as you were sharing over in the chat, the things that you learn to do, you learn to do the moment you wanna know it. That is how we live in 2020. We don't learn something just in case someday I need to learn it, right? We learn it the moment we need to. So just fixed washing machine pump. I don't know anybody that when they buy their washing machine says, you know what? I better go watch a video on how to fix the washing machine pump just in case someday it breaks. No, you wait for it to break and then you fix it yourself because instructional videos work and you pause them and you go do it. You get to rewatch them. All of this students get to do too. See in the classroom, the, te the students only get to hear the teacher say it once, but on a video, if my child needs to listen to my teacher five times, they listen to my teacher five times. They do this crazy old thing called rewind and they watch it again. Instructional videos work. We want teachers making great instructional videos. And then we want your kids showing up to a Zoom meeting or Google Meets ready to talk about what they learned with their teacher, with their classmates, having some fun. That's what our Zooms should be. Zoom should be about laughter, having fun, playing games, hanging out with other kids my own age. Because the instructional videos, that's the power. Research-based, best practice, and you already know it because you watch YouTube videos to fix your washing machine pump. That's where we're headed. Right? And we hear kids all the time. When I was talking to teachers before all of this, I was talking to teachers and parents at parent nights and they say, oh my gosh, my, when my kid grows up, all they say they want to do is they want to be a YouTuber. And they should, because if you want to know how to fix a, re if you want to be a dishwasher repairman, you better know how to make a YouTube video. If you want to be a car mechanic, you better know how to make a YouTube video. If you want to teach other people to play an instrument, better know how to make a YouTube video. Knowing how to make a YouTube video is preparing students for their future, not our past. So of course they want to be YouTubers. That's a revenue stream for them. If you can teach somebody else to do something, and you can do it in three to five minutes, you could be making money on YouTube too. Of course they wanna be YouTube stars. And here's what we have to understand, right? The world belongs to those who create, not those that consume. And when I'm talking with parents, one of the number one questions I get all the time from parents is how much time should my child be on a computer? And the problem is that's not the right question. The question isn't a time question. The, the question is, what are they doing? There is no research. Even the Ame American Pediatric Society has changed their recommendation. To, it's not about time. It's about what are they doing? What is your child doing on a computer? The world belongs to those who create, not those that consume. If your child is sitting around watching cats ride on Roombas all day, you limit that to whatever you feel is appropriate as a parent, the age of the child. There's no right number. If you believe it's 10 minutes, it's 10 minutes. If you believe it's 30 minutes, it's 30 minutes. Trust yourself. However, if your child 
is on a computer and they're creating. They're creating incredible worlds in Minecraft. Or they're in Fortnite where they're creating teams to conquer the world. Or they're creating stories. Or they're creating music. Or they're creating videos. That, that is a completely different part of the brain. And those are kids honing their skills for a future with computers. So instead of asking, how much time have you been on the computer today? Ask, what have you been doing on the computer today? I had a student, friend of mine, high school kid, who decided that he took this time during the pandemic to become an artist. Because you know, in Spotify, anybody, anybody can go to Spotify and set up an artist account and if you know and love how to make music, you can become a published artist right next to the Beatles on Spotify. You can make YouTube videos. If kids know how to do something crazy, make YouTube videos. Teach other people how to do it. The world belongs to those that create, not those that consume. How are we helping and encouraging kids to create with technology? Not create, not consume social media posts but create with it. It's an incredible tool. We also have to prepare students for their future, not our past, in the way that you get hired, right? Some of our kids, that's, not everybody needs to go to university or college, totally fine. But then you need to be prepared to how do you get into the workforce? And here's what we know. The last time they looked at any data was in 2018. And in 2018, 94% of all hires in America came from a little site called LinkedIn. And the age to set up a LinkedIn profile is 16. So if your child or students are 16 years of age or older, we need to get them into LinkedIn. We need to get them connecting. You want to be a veterinarian? Go connect to veterinarians. You want to be a car? You want to repair cars? Go be, go find car repairmen. Do you want to be construction worker? Go find construction. You want to drive truck? Want to work on the farm? Go find some farmers. All right. Learn how to create networks because this is how you get hired. Somebody finds you on LinkedIn through these connections. They then do a social media, I call it an interview. They do a social media interview on you. You don't even know what's going on yet, right? Where they're looking at your social media accounts, kids, and they're wondering what kind of person you are based on the information that you're posting in your social media. And now they have enough information of who you are and what you're like that they can do a Google search for you. This is the most powerful resume anybody has right now is a Google search. If your name comes up in Google search, that is so powerful. And only after you have passed these three interviews that you didn't even know were happening, only then do companies ask you for your resume. If you're going to university, universities do exactly the same thing. Over 90% of the universities in America do a social media check on students before they come into university, before they're accepted. This is how you get hired today. And you need to know how to learn online. You need to know how to work from home. You, have, you understand how networks work, why it's important to reach out to people, how to make a YouTube video and have a YouTube channel for your social media. It's important. That's preparing kids for their future, not our past, right? Now we wanna talk about taking tech breaks because it's also great, as we all know, to not be on technology all the time. But we need to really be thinking about how are we taking family tech breaks? Parents, adults, we set examples for our kids. We set examples for our kids in every, every day, every decision we make. So we also need to set examples when it's time to put the technology away. It's time for everybody in the family to put down the phones, shut them off. They have off buttons. It's incredible. Like you can turn them all the way off. Unbelievable. And the entire family needs to turn them off and have time away together. And away together it can be on the couch, it can be playing a board game, it can be outside playing a game. And here's the biggest issue I have with this, is when I'm supporting families doing this, it's never the kids who have a problem putting down the tech. It's never the kids who are the ones that have to have their phone in their back pocket just in case somebody might call. We set examples. And so let's take tech breaks as an example. Let's make that our new example. How are we getting off these devices? Getting up, moving around as a family is so critical. 
We have to be thinking about this idea between digital addiction and, and highly engaged. And I'm not saying that digital addiction isn't out there. It is. There are kids who, and people, I don't even say kids, just people who can get addicted to their devices. But more often than not, what we see is we see highly engaged students and parents, families, you probably know a highly engaged student. These are the kids that beg you. They beg you to buy the latest game for the PlayStation. Beg you. They just have to have the game. And they play the game nonstop for three months. And then one day, they're done. And they never touch the game again. And you paid 120 bucks for this game. And all of a sudden, they don't, right? They don't play it anymore. That's a highly engaged kid. That's a highly engaged student who is trying to solve a problem. Games are problems and they're trying to solve a problem. It's the same thing that happens with books. You probably know people or you might be somebody yourself that you get highly engaged in books. Nobody would say you're addicted to reading, but you might get highly engaged in books and you can't put a book down. We have kids who walk around our schools who bump into other kids because they're so into their book, they can't put their book down. That's a highly engaged kid. And as soon as they finish the book, they put the book written down and never come back, right? Addiction is something completely different. When we're talking about addictions, I am not a psychologist or sociologist. So I'm not a doctor. I can't make any uh, medical diagnosis for anyone. But what we're looking for is we're looking for physical uh, physical things happening to the body, right? Not eating, not sleeping, giving up physical well-being because of devices. Those are your signs to reach out for help. But most of the time, what we see is highly engaged kids. And highly engaged kids, highly engaged kids are great. But highly engaged kids, you can also set a timer. Yeah, you want to play Fortnite. Fantastic. 20 minutes? All right, we'll set a timer for 20 minutes. At the end of 20 minutes, game's off and you got to do something else. 30 minutes, whatever it happens to be. A lot of times, especially during this pandemic, we are seeing kids using games like Fortnite, and I just use Fortnite as an example, as a way to hang out with their friends. A lot of times, when you, if you ever overhear your, your child or a student playing games with others inside these worlds like Fortnite, if you ever overhear the conversation, very rarely is it about the game. <laughs> this is where they hang out. You used to hang out at the A&W. You used to hang out at the bowling alley. Kids today, they hang out at Fortnite. Okay. And it's probably safer in there than it was at the bowling alley. Parents are home, maybe. Okay. So just be thinking about this idea of highly engaged kids. We see that a lot. Know that your computer should be in a central place. When we talk about creating a, a place for kids to work, we want to come create a place that is central to the house. We want to get kids out of their bedroom. The bedroom is a place to sleep. That's not an office, right? That's where you sleep. Can you have an office somewhere else? Where would that be? It's also great parents because I'm going to tell you, no teacher is sending home homework that's going to take three hours. If your child is working on an assignment for three hours, there's something else going on in that computer, right? We're encouraging teachers to actually put how much time a task should take on their assignments they send home. So the goal is you're going to get an instructional video with materials for children to do. And the teacher is going to say, this activity should take roughly 30 minutes or this activity should take roughly 15 minutes. So that when they are involved, you as a parent can help and support. But if it's taking your child three hours to do a 20 minute activity because they're in their room learning, they're not focused. There's other things going on. They're being distracted by YouTube videos, by other things. They're not in that 20 minute focus time. So we want computers whenever possible to be in a central location where we can see them. We can pop over, right? They're kids. They've got kid brains, easily distractible. Another thing that I like to encourage families, this is one of my favorite things to do, is encourage families to have a central place for charging. The research on having this next to your bed is overwhelmingly negative, especially for kids. There's no reason, absolutely zero reason for a student to have a device 
in their room while they're sleeping. No reason whatsoever. So we want to create, maybe this is a fun activity you do as a family. We want to create a central charging place. This is one that a family made out of a shoebox. Everybody's cords, there's a, there's a charging strip inside. Everybody's cords are here. And it's so easy. Parents, it's so easy when you get to just walk by and you can see what devices are missing before kids go to bed. There's no reason for any child to have a device. In fact, the research shows adults, it's not good for you either. Having this next to your bed ruins your sleep. I still do it, right? But it's not good. It's not good. I use it as my alarm clock rather than going buying an alarm clock for $9.99. But for our kids, there is no excuse. There is no excuse for your children. Get the devices out of the bedroom while they're sleeping and have some kind of fun activity create some kind of cool space. I had another family make one that was kind of like the dividers for file folders and all the, every device had its own, you know, laptops and iPads and uh, PlayStations, uh, whatever it was, they all had their slot and it made it so easy for parents at nighttime could walk through and see that everything's plugged in fully charged in the morning for everyone ready to rock and roll the next day. But there's no need to have it in your room when you're sleeping. No need. So put it in a, put it in a central spot. Bedtimes are still important. Get to bed, get a good night's sleep, right? Good eight hours a night. Bedtime is still critical, even from learning from a distance. So whatever your bedtime is, whatever's appropriate for you, your family, make sure that we're sticking to it. It's a critical piece to learning. We've got to be ready to learn. And lastly, as I shut this down and maybe you have time to, to answer some questions that have come up in the chat, or Amanda and, and Shane can maybe ask me some here with about 10 minutes left. We also have to understand this is our new normal. This isn't going away. Technology isn't going away. Even if, even when kids get to go back to school, even when we are fully back to students in the classroom, technology is not going away. This is, we are forever changing the landscape and we need to make sure that we're preparing students for their future and not our past. We have to prepare kids to work from home, not work in an office. We have to prepare kids to know how to learn online. And we have an opportunity here to support our children, to support students and getting ready for the world that awaits them. It's an incredible world. It's gonna be so much fun, but we have to do it responsibly. We do it one step at a time. And with loving, caring parents and guardians by your side, it's an incredible place to be. Shane, Amanda. I will stop sharing my screen and I will let you, I don't know if there's any questions that have come up over in the chat or things you'd like me to touch on or other things here. I think you could tr you touched on it a little bit, but one of the questions that came up was about the importance of still maintaining that social interaction in, in a distance learning model. Can you wanna talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I think that's the hardest thing that we have going for us right now because it is such a critical to child development and it's critical, not just child development, we're all missing each other. <laughs> we just put it out there. We are all missing each other. Um, and it is, it's, it's a critical piece. It's a critical piece to being humans is to be social. And what we're trying to do, and especially at school, and this is our focus with teachers in that is what your Zoom and Google Meets for. And I apologize. Are you guys Google Meets or Zoom? We're mostly Zoom. Mostly Zoom. Yeah. So yeah. that is what we want teachers doing in their Zoom meetings. We want it to be highly social. We want kids to be talking to each other and having conversations and, and doing the best we can. Is it perfect? No, nothing about this is perfect. But we do wanna make sure that we are not forgetting those social emotional needs of our kids. And that's what we want our Zooms focused on. I want parents to report that they're hearing their children laughing in a Zoom meeting, right? I wanna, I wanna hear reports that students are talking all the time in Zoom meetings and not listening to a teacher give instructions. That's what the video is for. That is our time, the best that we can to be as social as possible. Because we did lose that. Yeah, agreed. One of the things, uh, a question came up about schedules and we are gonna have schedules. The first draft of our schedules will be out this week. And I think that that's an important message that you talked about tonight, the idea of um, learning chunks. I mean, what people are gonna see, they'll see schedules and our schedules are very high level, right? I mean, it's gonna show some of the live learning time, the asynchronous learning time when they can learn on their own. 
But I want parents to be aware that those live chunks does not mean that they're going to be sitting there for an hour listening to a teacher, right? I mean, our, our teachers don't want to do that. We know our kids don't want that. Might be live time where they do some collaborating. It might be a, a quick mini lesson and they go off and do something and come back, right? So just don't, don't fret about seeing those live times on there and thinking my kid can't sit there for that long. We're, mm -hmm. we're aware of that. And that's something we're trying to work with our staff on as we prepare for the year is how do you chunk that time up which is just good teaching anyway. It's how we, what yeah. we should be doing in the classroom. Absolutely. And the same thing with the asynchronous times, you know, in your, and I haven't seen the schedule, but in your yeah. schedule, a lot of times, if it's like, here's an hour of time, your child should be working at home. There's going to be an instructional video from the teacher, but, but that is where parents, we need to be thinking about, okay, that's an hour of time. That's actually should be like three 20 minute chunks with five minute breaks. Like that's what that hour time is. It's not sit here for an hour and work. It's okay. That's our hour from 10 to 11 AM. We got to have three 20 minute chunks, five minute breaks in between. What's that going to look like for us? Yeah, that's great. And that's where you have to have that home schedule that supports yeah. the schools. And I love that you said that, right? The school schedule is really this high level. Here's kind of what the structure is going to look like. Right. But what we also know is parents are asking for flexibility. So how do you create a schedule that's flexible? Good luck, every school district <laughs> coming up with that, right? Uh, yep, and, and we're going to learn right along. I mean, yeah. we've, we've been at it all summer and, and we're excited about the direction we're going. I mean, obviously, like you said, we want to be back with kids. I mean, yeah. we want to have kids in our buildings. Uh, but, you know, as we learn, we're not going to be rigid about it. I mean, if we have to make adjustments to our schedules and as we learn and we hear from you, uh, we're going to make those shifts. So. Um, our, our drafts of schedules will be out this week. We have a ton of resources available on our reopening website right now. We have our different, our different learning model options that are available. Uh, the different health stages are available. What our communication tools are gonna to be, our core four as Jeff calls them, the, the tools that we're gonna be using for digital learning and for communication. Those are all in one infographic. We've got almost everything translated into Spanish now. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we've been putting a lot of work into it. We're excited, we're nervous, just like you are. Uh, but we're excited about what we're going to be able to do this year. Uh, and we're excited about taking some of these lessons and putting them into our future of how we educate kids, really. Yeah, so, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, I want to thank Steel Education Foundation. Great organization. I've been a part of it for several years for the co-sponsorship tonight. Uh, the people that were on board tonight and especially Jeff for his message. It's such an important one. Um, even without the pandemic, like you said, we are moving towards a digital world more and more and more. And it is our job as a school to support our students' future and to change the way we think about how we educate. Because honestly, schools have not changed in over a hundred years. And so uh, this is a time when we can seize this opportunity. And uh, we need you too, as parents, uh, as families, we need your partnership. We need you to communicate with us. Uh, we need to know how we can support you. Uh, this video is one example. Uh, Jeff's talked about his modules. We have other modules about Google Classroom coming out. Uh, we're going to do more Q and A's. Uh, we just want to be here and be a resource for you as we as we launch this year. So, don't forget, there's a survey online right now uh, that talks about the different learning options, and we're looking for what your preference would be. And so, uh, that's on our homepage. And so, please take a, about one minute to complete that. Uh, with that, I, I just want to again thank everyone. Jeff, any final words or Amanda? No, I think I'm good. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate you staying, coming around. 38 people. I think we had a high of 40 some at some point. Yep, so 47 at the top. You know, yeah, great. we'll get this. We'll get the link. Make sure we can uh, link it to our site so people can watch yeah. it as well. All right. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a Thank safe you. and healthy Thanks, night. Everybody.